Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to give folks just a minute or two to settle in and get logged in, whether you're joining us on Zoom or on Facebook Live. Thank you again so much for joining. I'm Lakeland Hogan, gerontologist and caregiver advocate for Home Instead Senior Care. We really appreciate you joining today's live caregiver chat. I'm joined by um, two wonderful individuals. I'll formally introduce them later, but Jason Resendez and Stephanie Monroe from Us Against Alzheimer's. Hello and welcome. We're excited to have both of you today. Hi, thanks for having us. Thank you. Oh, it's our pleasure. Um, and we're all, again, we're excited to have all of you join us. We'd love to hear where you're joining us from. I am uh, coming to you from Omaha, Nebraska. Jason and Stephanie, where are you coming from today? Uh, I'm in Washington, DC. And I'm, in, and I'm in Virginia, about an hour and a half outside of Washington. All right, so we have several time zones involved today. Uh, and again, we would love to hear where you're coming to us coming to us from, uh, you can chat in the uh, comments box, the chat box at the bottom of the Zoom platform. Uh, you can also just comment on Facebook if you're watching us live on Facebook. Uh, we would love to know where you're coming from. Again, we're so happy that you've joined us today. Our event uh, title for today, or our, th our theme, uh, is how Alzheimer's and other types of dementia impact communities of color. And so we're gonna be diving into that topic in just a little bit. Uh, but again, we're giving people a few minutes to get settled in. Uh, we have lots of people commenting in where they're joining us from. We have Brenda from Georgia. We have um, Anne from Canada. So now it's an international chat. I love when that happens. Uh, we have people coming to us from coast to coast. So this is really exciting to have you all joining us for a really important topic. Before I jump in, uh, I do want to go over a few quick housekeeping items. Um, we are recording today's live chat and we will post it back out on our website. So if you want to pass it along to someone who can't make it today or you want to watch parts of it again, we will make it available. We've also muted everyone's lines if you're joining us on Zoom. Uh, that way it reduces background noise. We'll also be taking questions at the end of today's live chat. So feel free to uh, add your questions at any time throughout today, and then we'll tackle them towards the end of our live chat. If you're on Zoom, you can use the chat box or the Q&A box. If you're joining us on Facebook, just comment below, uh, and we'll make sure to get to as many of your questions as possible. And then we also want to stay connected with you. We have a great Facebook page that we would love for you to like and follow. Uh, we do these chats monthly, uh, so we'd love to have you back again next month. So I think that takes care of the housekeeping items. Uh, again, my name is Lakeland Hogan. I'm Home Instead's gerontologist and caregiver advocate for Home Instead Senior Care. Uh, and I'll be introducing our guest experts in just a moment. As I mentioned, today we'll be talking about how Alzheimer's and dementia, other dementias, impact communities of color. Our country over the past months uh, have had, we've had a lot of discussion across the country about social justice and equality and disparities in our society. Uh, and I'm the first to admit that I still have a lot to learn in this topic area. And I recognize the importance of having conversations like this to gain a better understanding of these types of issues. And we know in the Alzheimer's community, uh, we've been talking about disparities for many years. Alzheimer's disease and other dementias really impacts people regardless of their race, ethnicity, gender, education level, socioeconomic status, but it also disproportion disproportionately impacts some communities such as African Americans and Latinos. Uh, in fact, 20% of Americans today living with Alzheimer's disease are African Americans. And we know that Latinos are 1.5, so one and a half times, more likely to be diagnosed than non-Latino whites. And so in today's chat, we're gonna be talking more about these communities of color that are more heavily impacted by dementia. And I'm joined by two experts from Us Against Alzheimer's. Home Instead's a proud partner of Us Against Alzheimer's. They are a national advocacy organization dedicated to mobilizing advocates to demand a cure in deeply affected communities, uh, such as uh, African Americans, Latinos, and women. So we have two guest experts today, so we'll have a, a panel discussion. I'm very excited uh, to introduce both of our speakers to you. 
So first is Jason Resendez. He's the director of Us Against Alzheimer's Center for Brain Health Equity and the head of Latinos Against Alzheimer's Coalition. Uh, from clinical trial inclusion to paid family leave for dementia caregivers, he champions brain health equity at every level of the healthcare system. He is co-author of Latinos and Alzheimer's Disease, New Numbers Behind the Crisis. Uh, it's a report that was released uh, with USC. Um, and he's a contributor to the NIA's National Strategy for Recruitment and Participation in Alzheimer's and Related Dementia Clinical Research. Uh, prior to Us Against Alzheimer's, Jason helped uh, held senior positions at two of the lead, uh, nation's leading Latino serving organizations, um, Un Unidos US and uh, National Education Service Centers. Uh, and Jason um, is a next generation, uh, Google next generation policy leader and Aspen's Ideal Health, Ideas Health Fellow. And he serves on boards such as the Youth Movement Against Alzheimer's and Consumers for Quality Care. So Jason, we're really excited to have you with us today. Uh, you come to us with a wealth of knowledge and experience. So welcome. Thanks. And then our next guest I want to introduce to you is Stephanie Monroe. She's the Director of Equity and Access and Executive Director of African Americans Against Alzheimer's, a network within the Us Against Alzheimer's organization that was founded in 2013. Uh, it's the first national network created specifically to raise awareness of the impact of Alzheimer's health disparities on communities of color uh, and women, uh, the, and the need for greater minority participation in clinical trials, and the importance of all communities to begin focusing on brain health and Alzheimer's risk reduction strategies across the lifespan. Stephanie is a, an attorney with three decades of federal policy or federal public policy experience, including her role as Assistant Secretary of Education for Civil Rights. Additionally, she's uh, held key staff positions in the United States Congress, including Chief Counsel of the U.S. Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions, as well as Staff Director of the Senate Subcommittee on Children and Families. So Stephanie also comes to us today with a wealth of experience uh, knowledge and, and background on this topic. So Stephanie, welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Uh, so um, I know that we have a lot of great information to cover today. And so I would like to just kind of start with a few questions uh, to really understand uh, this topic um, that um, we know is, is of, of great importance and the conversation around uh, equity, especially um, amongst Alzheimer's caregivers and those ex living with Alzheimer's disease is, is a, a rising topic. Uh, and so we know that the data shows the growing number in, the com in communities of color uh, that are being affected and impacted by Alzheimer's disease and dementia. So I'm wondering if we can talk about first why these communities are seeing a higher rate of dementia diagnosis. So Jason, would you mind kind of setting the stage and giving us a little bit of that backstory? Sure, uh, and thanks first, thanks so much for having us and excited to be engaged in this really important conversation. Um, you know, Alzheimer's and related dementias, it is one of the trickiest challenges that our nation's public health system faces, especially in light of the COVID epidemic, a, a pandemic. Um, you know, it's really this combination of the pandemic and the ongoing epidemic of Alzheimer's that we've been facing that creates a lot of challenges for communities, for health systems, for our economy. Um, and it's that multifaceted nature of the disease uh, that really contributes to this being such a pressing health equity challenge. Uh, and so there's no n one reason why communities of color are at higher risk um, of Alzheimer's and related dementias. You know, instead it's a combination of factors that over the lifespan really contribute to these inequities um, in brain health that Black, Latino, and other communities of color and low-income communities face. Uh, so those issues, you know, relate to socioeconomic conditions, including lower levels of educational attainment, um, access to high quality education and early age uh, is a big issue for uh, underserved uh, communities, particularly black, Latino communities. Um, issues related to nutrition and access to quality exercise opportunities 
um, contribute to this issue, as well as comorbidities, you know, issues like higher rates of diabetes, higher rates of cardiovascular disease contribute. There's also a demographic element to this. Uh, you know, when I think about the Latino community and in my past roles, we were working with organizations that were really interested in marketing to the youngest segment of the American population, right? Sort of young Latinos. But the flip side of that is that Latinos will make up a growing share of the older adult population in the US. In fact, uh, combined, Latinos and African Americans are growing, uh, are aging the fastest compared to other demographic groups. And the number one risk factor for Alzheimer's is advanced age. So the fact that Latinos and African Americans will over the coming decades make up a larger and larger share of the 65 and older population means that we're at, in the age categories uh, at most risk uh, for Alzheimer's and related dementia. So it's a multifactorial issue, which makes it so difficult to address, you know, addressing these these you know deeply entrenched inequities uh in addition to some realities that we can't change like the demographic shifts that are happening um so it's a tricky issue but it's one that we'll never solve if we don't have these kinds of conversations if we don't start to really understand recognize and measure um these multifaceted uh aspects of the disease Thank you so much for sharing that, Jason. I, I think it is important to understand that it's just not any one factor. And I think that's, um, you know, and it, yeah, again, imp an important thing to understand that it's a multi-factor, um, um, multi-factors that, multiple factors, pardon me, that come together that can help to, or that contribute, pardon me, to um, these, these higher rates of dementia diagnosis. Uh, and Stephanie, would, do you have anything additional to add? Um, is there still, uh, I know widely stigma is still attached to an Alzheimer's and dementia diagnosis, um, but is that also true uh, in communities of color that are impacted by Alzheimer's and other dementias? Yes, I think it's um, definitely still um, the case. And it's changing with things I think are getting a little better, um, but there certainly are um, widespread misunderstanding about mm -hmm. dementia, about the fact that it actually is a disease like diabetes and that there are things that you could do to modify that risk and that we're looking for medications to hopefully address it. Um, it is perceived in many communities, I think especially as a black community, um, as more of a mental health issue which unfortunately many people in minority communities don't accept, won't seek therapy for. Therefore, when they begin to see signs of memory loss, um, un inability to pull their words, things of that nature, they think it's just stress. In fact, some people will call it sometimes disease. Sometimes I remember and sometimes I don't. I see. One of the things that we have to do is speak, make sure people understand there's a difference between forgetfulness and memory loss. So everyone experiences from time to time forgetfulness. That could be due to lack of sleep, um, just too much stuff on your plate. It can be due to stress. But actually memory loss, where you aren't able to remember something that you did routinely, um, almost by muscle memory, like how to get to your home, um, mm -hmm. how to get to a church that you went to every week, and that doesn't come back, right? doesn't come back, you strain, you try to get your brain to remember it and it just can't. Um, that's loss and that is not normal parts of aging. Um, mm -hmm. And so there needs to be you know, more education, more awareness of what these uh, symptoms look like as early as possible when in fact medicines, medicines may be able to actually help with those symptoms. Um, and a dialogue with doctors who frankly aren't being as aggressive and offensive as we'd like them to be in terms of raising or discussing brain health. Um, I was um, recently talking to some people who were, they basically said, you know, it's like the brain, the head is decapitated from the rest of the body. Mm. We talk about the heart, we talk about muscles, we talk about our, you know, gout, we talk about all these other things, breast cancer, awareness of just how the body functions, but the most important organ of the body that controls everything we don't talk about that. Mm -hmm. It's having a conversation about that. And if your doctor doesn't raise it with you, if you have some concerns or you're concerned about your loved one, you may have to be the one to actually raise it with the doctor to try to get those questions um, asked and answered. 
I think that that's uh, really helpful, Stephanie, in understanding uh, the stigma that that still exists in some communities. And uh, I think, you know, education is something that's that's so important uh, for us all in learning those 10 signs of uh, memory loss. I know, um, you know, exactly what you described. There's some normal forgetfulness that happens as we get older. And I mean, I'm even guilty of losing my keys from time to time, but we can retrace our steps. And uh, those with um, normal cognition can retrace their steps, but those with cognitive deficits or impaired cognition might not be able to retrace their steps. And you, you are right, if those, when those norm, non-normal things are happening, it's important to raise those concerns with a healthcare provider. So um, thank you so much, Stephanie, for sharing. Uh, and I also know that, um, you know, after a diagnosis, or even if someone's experiencing cognitive impairment, uh, likely they're going to need more help and assistance over time because it's a progressive disease. Alzheimer's and most dementias are, are progressive in nature. Um, and so usually that falls first to family caregivers. And we know that there are millions of family caregivers across the nation um, and or care partners. Uh, and caregiving can really take an emotional toll, a physical toll and a financial toll. Uh, we see that over and over again in, in the research that's out there. And so I'm wondering, are these impacts not only, um, so we've talked a little bit about the diagnosis, but those that are caring for those with a diagnosis, is the impact uh, greater or are we seeing the same kinds of impacts in communities of color um, in the African-American and Latino communities? So Stephanie, uh, do you have some thoughts on that? I do, and I can sort of share from you know, personal experience. My father um, uh, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's about seven years after I began this work. And I felt like I was being prepared for what was to come. Um, he and my mom, I have both of my parents are still alive. They're, my dad is 84, my mom is 87. Um, I also have um, an aunt who has Lewy body's dementia, um, which is a very complicated dementia with um, psychoses and aggression and paranoia in addition to the forgetfulness pieces that you see. Um, and yeah, there, I think, I don't know that, that there is a difference necessarily dependent on um, your race or your ethnicity. But I can say that um, African Americans and I think Latinos are much more reluctant to seek out of home care and mm -hmm. in home care, both from you know, them be believing or us believing we can, we're the best place for our parents. We can, we can certainly take care of this. Um, we don't need outside help and just the denial mm -hmm. in terms the need or um, how it's going to impact our lives. I mean, it's something that even though I have lots of knowledge and speak on this issue all the time, when it comes to your own personal family, you know, it's almost like your split personality. One side of you is speaking what you know to be the reality from books and studies and things of that nature. And the other is, you know, I recall just sitting in the doctor's office with my father and fully thinking it was just, you know, a series of many strokes that he was having that was causing these issues. Um, and wanting the doctor to say anything but the word Alzheimer's. Um, and so mm -hmm. when he first said vascular dementia, I was somewhat relieved, although the symptoms are exactly the same. Mm -hmm. um, but it was just something about that word that has, I mean, it is when they've done polls, it's the most feared disease in America. It's actually yeah. one of costly diseases because unlike other conditions where you have insurance to cover um, the treatment and the care um, with Alzheimer's unless you are on Medicaid um, the long-term care expenses are not going to be paid for so mm -hmm. you know we did finally come together as a, um, a family and I wouldn't say it felt like the best decision but to put my parents let them go into um, right now they're in independent living but we're paying for not quite around the clock care, but certainly full daytime care five days a week. Um, and it is enormously expensive. And you know, many parents, I think, um, and even in our generation, we think that these things aren't going to happen to us. We're going to maintain our independence. And it ends up being that many of the long-term care strategies end up being, well, the next generation will take care of me. Mm -hmm. and obviously very disruptive, um, especially as we're seeing more millennials um, come into this space, more sandwich generation 
you know, I've got kids, they were in college when all this happened and I'm trying to adjust to being caregiver for my parents, taking care of my kids, taking care of the home, you know, you're burning three lights instead of yeah. the you know, that you need. Uh, so emotionally, financially, with I can just speak um, in general that my, my aunt who has Louis bodies, <clears throat> excuse me, she and her husband live in Los Angeles and she does require now 24 seven care. They're paying um, close to $20,000 a month. Wow. With, you know, just the caregiving facility that they live in and then to have someone come in and just stay the night, $20,000 a month. Um, thankfully they have resources um, that allow them to be able to do that. But many, I mean, most people just, I don't know what you do with that situation. Yeah, the financial piece for so many families um, is, is an extreme impact. And, uh, you know, I think when you, I know that there's statistics out there, I don't have them right in front of me, but if you were to add up the cost of this disease, it's in the trillions of dollars. If you equate, you know, the amount of care, if we were to put a price tag on what the family provides, um, there's just so much that goes into supporting individuals living with this disease. And, and I think because of great work of organizations like Us Against Alzheimer's, um, policy and the policymakers are starting to kind of wake up to this reality that there are so many people living with this disease and so many people caring for them. And so we're starting to have more and more conversations. Um, but, but again, we know that um, there are certain communities that are uh, going to be impacted at higher rates and and growing number of uh, people diagnosed in certain in certain uh, sectors of of the population. So um, I know uh, I recently read a st statistic that by 2030, Latinos and African Americans will make up nearly 40 percent of the projected 8.4 million Americans impacted by Alzheimer's disease. And 2030 is just 10 years away now. Um, and so I guess. When we're talking about um, you know, health equity, how can we take a proactive approach to health equity for those impacted by the disease, both now and in the future? I think that that's important because we know that people are living with it now, but we do want to you know, help those that are going to come uh, in the, or going to be diagnosed and supporting uh, individuals in the years to come. So Jason, uh, do you have some thoughts or uh, information to provide there? Yeah, and I think it ties in nicely with the discussion uh, around better understanding kind of different caregiver burden. I think in order to advance equitable care, to advance equitable research, which I'm sure uh, we'll touch on a little later, we have to understand the different ways that the disease impacts different communities. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that means looking at and understanding this from a racial lens. Uh, looking at it from a socioeconomic lens and sort of collecting the data and understanding the problem uh, free, from these different aspects. Uh, so, you know, for example, we know related to caregiving, uh, it's really important to collect subgroup data. Uh, so thanks to folks like AARP and the National Alliance for Caregiving uh, and others, uh, we see really great work being done to help us understand uh, caregiver hardship across different communities. Uh, so just to provide some of the stats that you mentioned, do we know that, for example, Latino, uh, Black families, uh, Asian American families, they're more likely to have their care recipient live in the household with them mm -hmm. than uh, uh, their white peers. Um, we also know that they're more likely to provide higher a higher number of hours uh, to that care for that individual than their white peers. So understanding kind of the burden from a subgroup perspective, I think is really critical to advance equity. I think that's kind of the baseline. You, know, you can't improve what you don't measure. So if there are you know, folks listening that are providing services uh, to the community, really thinking about what are you doing to understand how effective those services are across different communities. Or if you're an advocate, uh, you know, navigating this, you know, really thinking about demanding uh, that your service providers or uh, your, you know, federal agencies are collecting better data in order to provide better services. So I think that's a really baseline um, approach to advancing equity uh, within, 
you know, you name it, you know, insert research and soup care services, you know, we really have to start uh, from that foundation. And then I think on top of that, we have to turn what we learn into action. We have to recognize that a yeah, one size fits all approach does not work with dementia and Alzheimer's. It doesn't work with any um, uh, disease, um, but particularly with uh, this disease, which we spent the first you know, 10 minutes talking about how multifaceted the disease is. Mm -hmm. right? It has a social economic component to it. It has a, a, obviously a medical component to it. Um, and so better understanding, I think, these different aspects, we have to translate those insights into programmatic solutions. Uh, so understanding that, you know, we're going to really have to think about um, uh, how we uh, in incorporate cultural sensitivity into our outreach and engagement services. Uh, you know, we learned this as an organization talking about brain health. Uh, and recognizing that brain health doesn't mean the same thing in all communities. Um, mm -hmm. And so taking that and acting on it and not expecting your messages or your services to resonate despite the good intentions that we all have in developing those messages and services, they might not resonate with those communities that need them the most. So collect data across subgroups, um, take that data and make sure that it's informing the development of tailored outreach solutions and engagement strategies. And I would just dovetail into what um, Jason yeah. said, you know, because one of the things we often, when we're taking care of a loved one, um, in, especially in our homes, our focus is so much on that individual that we forget about what we need ourselves. And so you often hear that the caregivers often get sick and some die before the person that they are providing care for. Um, Congress needs to be more attentive to the needs of caregivers themselves as a potential um, second patient to someone that they are providing care with. And we need programs that provide, for example, paid leave. Um, if I'm still um, expected or in the working environment and then my parents get ill or I need to bring them into the home, I may need to miss time to take care of them, take them to appointments. Um, do things of that nature that both improve their health and frankly my well-being to make sure they're taken taken better care of. Um, I might need some respite care, which is not you know really supported. They have small programs, but not to the significance that they need to make sure that I can go to the occasional get my nails done or just get a spa or frankly people who say I just want some time alone to go grocery shopping without having. Um, I've heard of pe people having to take their loved ones with Alzheimer's. Um, uh, to the grocery store with them and just put the person in the car um, because they couldn't afford to really leave them at home by themselves. So there are many, many needs. And I think especially um, among individuals caring for their parents or their relatives, the first step is getting them to realize that they are in fact a caregiver. Yeah. Many people just view that that's my role. I'm the daughter. So that's what I'm supposed to do. Well, that's true. But you're also now in a caregiving role and we need to make sure that you've received hopefully some training and that you're getting the support that you need, that mm -hmm. you're able to take the time that you need to take care of yourself so that you can, in fact can be a better care provider. So we really, I think this is a time as our nation continues to brown and age um, that we, and even with COVID that we're seeing a lot more strain on mm -hmm. individuals in their capacity and we're realizing how many additional resources the village needs to bring to help support um, people in this important and essential role that we absolutely as a nation need them to do because our system, our healthcare system and others aren't really um, uh, able to provide all of the care and the quality that's needed um, nationally. Yes, there's so many important points that you touched on there, Stephanie. I think uh, when we think about the support of the caregiver um, and those great things like, like respite um, and, um, you, sometimes, you know, the term caregiver, people don't self-identify, but some people don't understand what respite is and, and don't know uh, the resources that are out there to provide that or um, faith communities that have programs or, um, you know, I know senior centers right now, a lot of them are closed because of COVID. And so some of the resources that family caregivers were relying on are no longer available or temporarily unavailable. And so, um, there, there is a much greater need for support for family caregivers, but you're right, if, if they don't self-identify as a caregiver or uh, being in that care role, 
then it can really be prevented, uh, preventing them from getting much needed support. Uh, and you also mentioned, you know, working family caregivers. And uh, we know that there's a large segment of caregivers that are, are working and uh, you made It looks like we're experiencing a little technical difficulty. Um, so why don't we um, just go ahead and take it, Jason? And um, yeah, no, I think that the working this is the uh, the Zoom era, right? So we're all working to uh, uh, navigate this new reality. But I I think the you know you made a really good point about paid family leave and the plight of working caregivers and new research this year finds that of the 53 million family caregivers, right? There are 53 million unpaid family caregivers in this country, which is up about 21% than just five years ago. And um, this is not accounting for COVID. So I can just imagine that number today, but of those 53 million, over 61% are working. You know, 61%, over half of that um, 53 million are navigating care you know, thinking about your experience in Alzheimer's care being extremely specialized, having to navigate that while navigating the realities of work um, on top of, and we're thinking about the pandemic, on top of the pandemic, it's just an untenable situation that we're putting caregivers in, particularly right. working caregivers. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience? Well, you know, and, 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 and you know, because we, we work, uh, do a lot of work advocating for people and you know, we really need to get the word out. I mean, Congress is doing a good job of coming around to the um, notion that it's important for people who are um, giving birth or adopting or attending to a foster child to have that time to spend with their babies. Um, we've got some provisions that provide right now unpaid leave, but you're protected that you're not going to get fired for taking it um, to care for your own serious medical condition or the condition or to provide the care to one of your loved ones. Um, the list of people that are covered are, are small, like grandchildren aren't included in that, cousins and others who might be in your family network that would step in and help this loved one, but getting receiving no real benefit themselves. So to advocate um, for that, um, because it's really important that caregivers be part of that conversation. And so us against Alzheimer's, Home instead, others, um, we formed a special alliance, um, Paidley Alliance for Dementia Caregivers, and you can go to our website and get more information about that, where there's an opportunity for every individual to say, you know, we've got these needs, we need those stories. Um, I can tell you, having worked on the Hill for most of my life, that it could, one story getting to the right person at the right time could make the difference. I can't tell you how many times we would legislate because of an anecdote that was shared from one constituent. So people need to know your voices absolutely matter. People don't know what you need unless you are um, able to share it. And I see that our host is back, so I'll turn it back over to Lakeland. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. That's never happened to me on a chat before. Um, the, the joys of working from home. I, I, I'm not quite sure where I cut out, but it sounds like you picked up the conversation at, at just uh, in just the right way. And um, so thank you for holding tight while I dealt with some technical difficulties. So. <laughs> Sure, we're talking um, about the plight of the working caregiver. Ah, uh, okay. Well, all right. Well, thank you so much for for finishing that that conversation. I know. Um, I'm sure you talked ab about some of the great work you're doing uh, in supporting those individuals who are caregiving and working. So, uh, thank you again for for picking up the conversation. Uh, so, I'll I'll keep it keep it going now, and hopefully with no with no further interruptions. Um, so I guess before we open it up for, for questions from our, from our audience, I know we've had a lot of great comments and questions come in. Um, how can we all help to de decrease the disparity gap that, that exists? I think that um, we all want to do our part. And so what are some ways that we can do that? I know there's probably a lot of different things and we've maybe touched on a few things throughout the chat, but I, uh, if you both could share, um, Jason, I don't know, maybe you want to get us started and then Stephanie, you can, can join in as well. 
Sure. I mean, I think um, one of the you know ways that you can help to address this issue is, I mean, it depends on kind of where you're coming from. You know, if you're coming from it as a service provider, really thinking again about what I said in terms of understanding who your patients, clients, uh, what does that base look like? You know, what does your community look like in terms of um, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, um, you know, geography, are you serving a rural versus urban community? Taking that understanding and translating that into your work, you know, through tailoring outreach and engagement. If you're a caregiver, uh, if you're a patient, um, you know, taking action, I know that's hard. It's easy for me to say as someone in DC, you know, not providing that same level of care. Um, but as Stephanie said, your voice matters and your voice has power, especially if you feel like you have no power in the caregiving situation that you're in. Uh, express that concern uh, to your uh, elected representative at every level. I mean, that's the other thing I think, you know, we are always talking about reaching out to your member of Congress or to your senator, but reach out to your city council, reach out to your mayor, let them know that this is something that is impacting your community. If you're a person of color caregiver, uh, if you're a patient of color, uh, make sure that they understand if you have unique situations that you've experienced. We've worked with so many caregivers who've talked about the racism that they've experienced in, uh, amongst their care providers, you know, physicians, uh, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, making that known, that reality known to every level of your elected um, uh, officials, I think is really important to have folks understand the unique situations that you're in and feel a sense of urgency to address those. And I know that sometimes that's a long game, um, but to your point about how we address this, not just today, but in the future, that storytelling is really important and having your voice heard is really important. Thank you, Jason, for sharing that. Stephanie, do you have any additions to this question of how we can all help to decrease the disparity gap uh, that exists today? So I think just very practically, the first step is to acknowledge that a gap exists, that there are differences um, in the way that people um, express their need, the way they need to receive their need without judgment. Um, so often when we get into this conversation, people, there are many people I would say who want to blame the victim, blame, you know, you're complaining about something, it's always been this way, there's nothing we can do about it. It's not, it's not a fatalistic approach. We have seen that we've been able, to, when we are very intentional, to narrow the disparity gap by making sure, and you asked earlier about the difference between equity and inequality. Equality is giving everyone the same thing. Well, when you've got communities where they are so underserved, giving them the same thing, it's not going to meet their need. So that's when you need equity to give them what they need to reach that, that point. So recognize that you may in fact have to invest um, more uh, deeply um, your time, your talent, your treasures in communities that have are having a more difficult time of taking advantage of services or even finding out where they are or even getting educational resources. They need a higher level of support just to get to that 50% threshold that we want people to function at. Um, and we have to be willing to do that. So I would say those are the you know, two biggest challenges and understanding also that you know, healthcare disparities um, exist across most disease states. You're always seeing things about African Americans, Latinos, two or three times or 20 times um, whites. And it's for a number of reasons, which we've talked about earlier, um, but a lot of it is awareness and a lot of it is um, physicians that are dealing with the crisis of the moment. We as a nation don't do a very good job of identifying prevention strategies. Mm -hmm. This is a disease that we know with some attention, we can mitigate some of those um, some of those things that would happen that might make a person more likely than not to develop this disease. We tend to focus on, gosh, the person is now in you know, level two of Alzheimer's and then they come in for an assessment. And at that point, it becomes, you're fighting them against this uphill battle, battle instead, of, instead of trying to 
even the playing field before things get really out of control. Um, so trying to you know, do what we can, make sure those services are um, available to all parts of the community, not necessarily just those that are easiest to reach. Um, some of the most, um, the neediest parts of the community are gonna be more difficult to reach because they have trust issues. The healthcare system has done, um, in some cases, really um, a great disservice to them. Um, in terms of, you know, just our history. Um, or as Jason was talking about, you know, they don't have Spanish speakers. They don't have people who understand the culture. They don't realize that you need to engage more members of the family than just this one person. So, so if you show up at a doctor's office um, and perhaps you're Latino and you need your grandchild to come in, well, some doctors would say, well, HIPAA doesn't allow your grandchild to come in, which is certainly not true. But then it creates that sort of disrespect of what that person needs to access the services. And I'm going to stop here because I could go on. <laughs> but that's what it really requires, giving the person what they need when they need it on their terms so that they can really understand it. If you throw out something and it's, you can't speak in their language, you, don't, you speak above their level of understanding, you're speaking to the wrong person, um, you basically may as, you may as well not have even tried. Um, to explain or to offer them services because you just haven't done in a way that's sensitive or even relevant to them at that moment. I think that that's a very important point. And I know Jason made uh, or provided the example earlier of, you know, some of the resources that you've created, you, you realized, okay, not brain health doesn't mean the same thing to every community. So how can we modify that to fit the culture and to fit um, uh, the understanding level uh, of those individuals so that they can get that that information. So I think that you're you're so right in providing that that point that that's something we can all do. Uh, and then also that prevention piece. I know uh, us against Alzheimer's. Uh, you have a great uh, wealth of resources on prevention. Uh, I've done your Be Brain Powerful campaign that you uh, have created, just uh, because we know that things that we do early on in our life can affect our brain health later. And we talk about prevention. Uh, we know that it's needing to start younger and younger. So I guess to, um, to round out our conversation before questions, I, I, it'd be great if you could share a little bit more about some of the resources that Us Against Alzheimer's has and where people can get that information. You might have covered that when I cut out briefly, but if you would just mind sharing again, that would be helpful for the audience. No, I'm happy to. Folks can go to our website, usagainstalzheimers.org, and I'm sure we can share the link um, uh, through the chat and on that we have you know different pages we have a page for our Latino network we have a page for our African American network we have a page for our brain health campaign um, which actually uh, actress uh, Mandy Moore from NBC's This Is Us just signed up as uh, an ambassador for that campaign to really put front and center those things that we can do uh, to prevent uh, cognitive decline in later life and to improve our brain health overall. Um, and so I think there are a number of things uh, that we can do, uh, but you know, like we talked about, a lot of that has been uh, developed for uh, a, a white community. Uh, so mm -hmm. Us Against Alzheimer's has partnered with the CDC, the National Association, of Black Nurses, the National Hispanic Nurses Association, and Alzheimer's Los Angeles to establish a new center, the Center for Brain Health Equity, that'll look at comprehensively what messages around brain health and the things that you can do exist uh, targeting high-risk communities, Latinos, African Americans as a, as a start, um, and make sure that those materials are accessible and that we're mm -hmm. filling gaps where needed um, mm -hmm. to uh, uh, make sure that that message is not just accessible, but also resonates and is evidence-based uh, for highly impacted communities. Uh, so that is, I think, a bridge we still need to build uh, because as we talked about, the research community and the body of research that we have today, unfortunately, has excluded uh, people of color uh, for a long time. And so we don't know if everything that exists today will be effective for those communities. So we have to start intentionally building those bridges to ensure accessibility um, and impact uh, in highly impacted communities. So you can take a start by going to the website um, but, and stay with us on this journey because there's a lot of work to do ahead. And if I could just add one final thought. Um, 
one of the things that we can um, do as a community, everyone can do, is look into clinical trials that you might qualify for. Um, we need everyone. When we have a medicine that's um, being looked at or different therapy, we need to make sure it works for everyone. And right now, about 96% of the participants are not Latino or half African American. Um, so when a medication comes out for us, we don't know if it's going to work or not because only 3% of us were included in clinical research. Um, so if your doctor mentions it, or you might want to from time to time ask your doctor, even if you're, because they need well people as well as people who are sick um, across a lot of different disease states. So you may want to ask, is there a trial that I might, some research that I could participate in to sort of help advance this if your doctor doesn't already raise that issue with you? But we can be proactive in that. Um, in terms of finding out how we can participate because cure is a lot cheaper than care if we can get mm -hmm. that. In Alzheimer's, we haven't had a new medication in the last 17 years. Um, so we're hoping that there will be a breakthrough. We're working really hard to encourage people at community level, um, level to start asking African-Americans and Latinos. 80% of people say they're not ever asked. Brain health not mentioned. They're not ever asked to participate in trials. Um, and then, um, unfortunately, sometimes it's really difficult to get in to trials because of the location, but we need to create that demand. And hopefully that list of people who say, I am ready. And trials can look like things, not just, you know, receiving a trial medication, but it could be something as simple as let's change your diet and see how that impacts on um, different disease states that you're in. Let's do different types of other interventions that aren't therapeutic. So we all have a place that we could participate and we just may need to raise our hand and ask our doctor, can you help me identify something I want to give back to my community in that way. Thank you, Stephanie, for bringing up clinical trials. I know uh, that's something that we wanted to make sure we shared with everyone today because you're right, the, um, the science, while there's a lot of it happening, a lot of research happening, uh, we do need that next uh, treatment or medication for this disease and we we need people to participate. So I know that your organization has some information on how to do so on your website. And you also have a, a conference coming up. I usually attend in person every year. I always look forward to your event because it, uh, the agenda is always so impactful. Uh, but this year it's going to be online. So uh, you can also probably find out information about that event on the website as well. Is that correct? Absolutely. And we welcome everyone to attend. Great. Uh, and then also I wanted to just uh, share a couple more resources for those that are providing care to a loved one right now. Uh, we know that we talked about how important, you know, respite is and time away. Uh, and both of our organizations work closely with uh, an organization called HFC. Uh, they uh, are founded by um, Lauren Miller Rogan and her husband, Seth Rogan, the actor. And they have really tapped kind of that millennial generation uh, for education and awareness, but they also provide respite grants. So for those who are providing care, uh, we'll put the link in there if you're looking for care and support. You can, of course, visit their website. Um, and then also Home Instead has some great free resources as well. And then the Us Against Alzheimer's website has some great information on how you can engage in advocacy and research uh, and join the conversation, have your, your message be heard. So um, I think now we have some time for a few questions that have come in. Um, so I'm just going to take a quick look at our chat box. If you have any questions for Jason and Stephanie, I know this is such a robust topic that just trying to limit the conversation to one hour has been really challenging, but I think we've covered a lot of great information so far. Um, so again, if you have a question, please feel free to chat. Um, um, in if the, I could just jump in, because there's yeah, one question that I want to make sure that we touch on um, yes please do and help in dementia is talked about in the q a a really amazing story and tragic story about you know reaching out and those cries going unheard and so one of the things i want everyone to know is that when it comes to and this is not going to be a silver bullet but i think it's an important resource for folks to understand and caregivers to understand is that your members of congress are there for policies but they're also there to help you navigate services. Uh, so if you uh, have, especially if you're a member of the veterans community, every member of Congress has someone who is a VA case manager. And so reaching out to that member and saying, hey, I'm a veteran, my husband's a veteran, I'm having this issue, 
um, you know, they can be really powerful in helping to navigate your requests through the VA, through um, uh, whatever that issue uh, might be. So I'd say really get to know that member of Congress and don't just bring to them your policy issues, but also bring to them issues that you might be facing in terms of navigating um, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, or especially the VA. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, that's a great a great resource to direct individuals to. Um, I, I don't know if you also mentioned the area agencies on aging. Um, I was trying, trying to scroll through and listen at the same time, but that's also a great resource and you can uh, look for your local agency nearest to you and oftentimes they have case managers or social workers that can help families navigate services and provide information local to your community. So um, that would be another resource that I would add. Um, I know we've had some questions coming in about, um, you know, qualifying for clinical trials and how it can be discouraging if you're, you're denied due to comorbidities. Um, I know that in addition to clinical trials, there's other types of ways that um, you can contribute. I know the A-list, the Us Against Alzheimer's A-list, uh, is, is one of those communities where you can participate in kind of some online um, research and questionnaires about your experience as a care provider individual living with dementia. Uh, but in addition to that thought, Stephanie or Jason, any other um, pieces of information or advice for those that are wanting to engage in clinical trials and maybe it's just they've kind of hit roadblocks along the way? Well, I can tell you that we are working um, in a really significant way to sort of change the way um, NIH and others, NIA, um, National Institutes on Aging, um, constructs clinical trials to make sure that they are designed to have the maximum impact in terms of inclusion and diversity. And so those conversations are ongoing in terms of what really do we need to be doing um, with both, both who we include and who we exclude that would allow the trial, allow the, the outcome to be um, of the right scientific rigor that you need, um, but also to be able to really, again, include as many people because in the end, medications and things like this will go out into populations where there are a lot of comorbidities and especially populations that are black and brown populations. So um, it's a work in progress. And I think there is a lot more willingness now to, to design trials that um, are more open and would allow more people um, to come in and, and to participate. And then I'll just add on top of that, and I just have added in the chat two links. One is to the A-list, which is a great way. And, and Brian, I see, and I totally agree with you. He says caregivers of color feel isolated and not included in the dialogue. That's completely true. And that's one of the reasons why we created the A-list is to bring these insights and uh, from caregivers of all backgrounds and make sure that we understand how they're different and that that's translated into research design. Because right now we have the research community who's doing things in a silo, not listening to people like Brian, not listening to people like Stephanie. Um, and so I think it's really critical um, to when we can find opportunities like the A-list to make sure that we're participating if you can. I also added Antidote, which can, is a really user-friendly uh, tool to help you find different trials in your community. Um, and you know, as Stephanie said, and as Brian is a, uh, you know, living the example, too often research trials are excluding people of color, even though they don't intentionally mean, or they say they don't intentionally mean to exclude people of color, but by having really strict inclusion and the criteria or exclusion criteria related to comorbidities or to related to needing to have a study partner or a caregiver, you know, all those things have effects. And so as Stephanie said, we are working hard to expand and demand that research, whether it's federal research or industry funded research, does better for black and brown and other communities of color um, who are facing Alzheimer's and want to take action through research. Thank you for sharing those links, Jason, and, and for engaging with our participants in the chat. Um, someone on Facebook 
asked, you know, what, what do I do if my loved one is in denial of their diagnosis? And uh, I might also kind of add on to that. Um, we talked about the stigma that exists still, you know, uh, widely, but also in communities of color. Um, and I'm wondering, do you have any resources on, um, on you know, um, what type of education or approach to education is most impactful? So I guess that's kind of a two-part question. Yeah, I love Stephanie. I think in terms of um, the power of culture to help change these kinds of conversations. Uh, one of the things that Stephanie does is a play called Forget Me Not, which is now on DVD. So Stephanie, I wonder if that's a great uh, you know, uh, option to help families navigate that denial and stigma. Right, something like that, which we call edutainment. So it's <clears throat> meeting people where they are, educating them, but also entertaining them, which makes the disease more um, accessible to people. So through a product like this, you're able to see what does Alzheimer's look like? What does it look like in a family setting? And we set up different scenarios so that you can see how it would impact um, friends, um, grandchildren, person who's in denial, which would, at this point would be the caregiver, the daughter, um, and how they you know, are visualizing different um, symptoms. So we sort of normalize that. And what happens as a result of this play, I mean, it's a very simple tool, um, but what has happened is people will sometimes come out of there and they're like, I think my mom has this, or that's what mm -hmm. Uncle Bob has. We just thought he was a sometime, or we just put him in a corner when we had family <laughs> dinners, right? But we just knew he was a little off or a little special. Um, the call is something different than what it is. And now they realize, well, maybe he actually has a condition. We, should, we might want to bring him out. Um, this whole issue of denial, it's so hard. and um, thankfully, I haven't had to go through it, but I have lots of friends, and that's their question. You know, what do you do when, or there's, a, there's an understanding that something's going on, but they don't want to go and get treatment. Um, or they want to be very private people. Um, or they go to the hospital and they release themselves against medical advice. Um, I mean, I know there are social services that will come in and meet people where they are, Area agencies on aging can bring in someone to try to talk to them. But it's, you know, some of it might be, and it's a, I guess it's an awful thing to say. Um, people do, we don't protect elders in the same way we protect children. Um, mm -hmm. And elders do have the ability to make decisions for themselves. So they want to probably hear from trusted, loving people who they don't feel necessarily um, have an alternative agenda. Um, the trust issue is really key in so many different ways. So, you know, you just got to be creative and figure out who's the best person in the family to approach them and be very thoughtful about what is the method that you can use that will actually communicate best to them. It may not be the doctor saying this because they may not be willing to go to the doctor. Um, mm -hmm. so it has to be really thought out. And in our family, it, it changes and we actually come together. I have siblings and we come together and basically strategize on some of these conversations and who's going to take what question um, and that might be necessary um, in, in different scenarios so it's it definitely is a, a challenge because you know sometimes you only get one bite at the apple um, my brother who's a doctor um, is sort of for me famous for um, I've learned from him that perception is reality and mm -hmm. Sometimes we're trying to change people's perception of who they are, what's going on. For them, that's the reality. And so you might be fighting against that. Um, but yeah, you got to be really thoughtful and think this through in terms of how you're going to approach people. Um, and then, of course, there's all these other legal issues about, you know, at what point can you get a power of attorney so that if they're not able to make their own decisions, getting people at that point where they can recognize, you know, just because I'm elderly, I may not be able to make these decisions, but bring, allowing the family to come in and encircle them and to show, you know, we don't have anything, we're not trying to get anything out of this, our only concern is you, but these are mm -hmm. the things that you put in place for your own protection. And it's, it can be a challenge. And Stephanie, just where can someone find a Forget Me Not uh, video or DVD? So um, it should be on our website and, um, or people can certainly email me directly um, I'll need to check and make sure we've got a link on the website, but people email me all the time to get a copy. Um, uh, we make it available uh, via donation um, only. And so um, 
if you're interested, you know, please check out our the African American Network website. You should be able to reserve a copy there. If you have any difficulty, please reach out to me, um, and I'll go ahead and type in my email address directly. Thank you both so much for just a really uh, informative conversation today. Uh, unfortunately, we're, we're coming to the end of the hour. I wish we could have answered every single question, but I appreciate both of you um, answering the ones that you did and providing your contact information and, and the website for more uh, resources and information that people can follow up on after today's chat. Um, before we say goodbye really quickly, I wanted to let everyone know next month's chat will be taking place on October 15th, and we're going to be talking about what it means to live well until the end. Um, end of life is not always uh, an easy conversation to talk about, but I'll be joined by Dr. Uh, Shoshana from End Well. Uh, her organization really brings up the issue of end of life um, and uh, also, especially during COVID-19, we've all kind of been faced with uh, thoughts about uh, end of life and what it means to live well to the end. So I hope you join us for that conversation. Uh, but Jason, Stephanie, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and, and thank you for your expertise and all the work you do to advocate uh, for those impacted by Alzheimer's and other dementias. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate the opportunity. Have a great day, everyone. We'll see you again next month. Until then, take good care of yourself while you're taking care of others. Bye.